Hi, welcome to Webpixel Live. My name's Adam Hanlon, and I'm joined today by our experts on all things underwater photography, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hi, Adam. Nice Hi. to see you. Nice to see you too. It's been a little while. How are you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. No diving here, I'm afraid. Yeah, well, it's pretty much the same here. So, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling very dry, um, which kind of brings us on to, to what I thought we might talk about today in that um, Alex has got a new book out um, and the book Ooh, covers yeah. with, with a, 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 a just talks about a wreck in the Red Sea, in the Egyptian Red Sea called the Thistlegorm. So, so the first thing really to ask Alex, tell us about the wreck, Alex. Tell us, tell us about it. Why is it so special? Um, what the Thistlegorm is uh, w was a British um, freighter, um, a cargo ship um, that during the Second World War was was carrying uh, military cargo, and was at anchor in the Red Sea, um, waiting for clearance to come through the Suez Canal into port, um, when she was bombed on anchor and and sank, and, and sadly nine people um, lost their lives when when she sank, and the wreck. The position of the wreck has always been known. She was a British ship sunk on anchor, and mm. the British marked the position of the wreck on the on the nautical chart straight away. But she actually sort of, um, for a long time, what you know was unknown. And the first person to dive on the wreck was Jacques Cousteau, one of the first people to explore the Red Sea. Mm. And then after Cousteau went there, again, really just through a lack of infrastructure in the area, it was a long time till people started diving the wreck regularly. But at the beginning of the 90s, she was kind of rediscovered although never really lost, was rediscovered as a diving attraction. And ever since then, has been one of, not just one of the most popular wreck dives in the world, one of the most popular scuba dives in the world. Mm. A few a few years ago, I was talking about the Pistol Gormans I've done many times at one of the UK dive shows. And, and Paul Rose, who's a, a British television presenter who talks a lot at the dive shows as well, is a National Geographic explorer in residence as well. People from overseas might know him better as that. He asked me, oh, how many people do you think have dived on it? And we did a quick back of the envelope calculation based, you know, on the number of dive boats you see there each day, the number of divers those boats have, the number of dives they do on the wreck each day. And we reckon it was something like about one and a half to two million dives have been done on this dive site. Yeah. So it really is a, you know, a special place in the in the realm of diving. And the reason the wreck is so special, is so loved by divers, is the fact that the, the ship was loaded with military vehicles and other military equipment, particularly military vehicles from military motorbikes to military trucks and lorries to even steam locomotives. Mm. And, when she, and, and when you dive her, you can not only see an amazing shipwreck, but you can see you know, more than 100 motorbikes, more than 70 vehicles on this wreck. Um, all, all you know, preserved from World War Two. So she's a fascinating place mm. to dive and, and been very popular. Mm. And um, you know, because of that, you know, we, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the output from this was the book. I'm keen to stress that the book isn't a solo effort. It's very much a team effort, and I've really enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, the team um, in alphabetical order. Um, Simon Brown, who's a sort of photo underwater photogrammetry expert. We, I did some wet pixel we lives some, yeah, with him. Yeah. Talk okay. about in, um, photogrammetry. John Henderson, who's a you know university uh, marine archaeologist. Um, Mike Potsons, who's um, is actually a sort of 3D modeling um, expert, a and myself as an underwater photographer. But to be honest, we've all mucked in on all aspects of it, from the the background research in military archives to visiting um, military vehicle festivals to try and actually understand what these vehicles were, and um, you know. I've de I did bits of the photogrammetry, you know, little bits for Simon and, um, you know, Mike and um, John were part of the field team with Simon that did a lot of the research and the surveying work yeah. on the wreck. And the upshot is this book. And I think what's really interesting about it is it really makes use of the photogrammetry models that we did, which are made up of 24,000 individual photos to map the whole outside and inside of the wreck so that you could finally have an absolutely reliable map. And what's the reason, despite this being such a popular dive site, the reason we wanted to do this book is the amount of misinformation about this wreck is so huge, particularly just the physical, let alone the, the diver's stories, yeah, yeah. the physical map that exists in dive you know, books and things like that are so far from truth. It, it's, not, it's almost as if you know, someone dived the wreck they got drunk in the pub, told someone about it. <laughs> that person then, well drunk from the pub, tried to draw a map. And those are the maps that got published. Yeah. And 
also, you know, because the military vehicles are such a big hook for the wreck for people to want to dive on. Um, but divers didn't know what they were because, you know, you need to be kind of a military vehicle expert and divers weren't. And the kind of the first people that dived the wreck kind of had a guess. And those guesses stuck for, you know, 25 years. And we all just kind of repeated the same things, me included. You know, I, I'd seen someone else's photo of this vehicle. So I said, well, it's the same vehicle this guy did. He must have or she must have identified that right. I'll just use the same name they did. And it just perpetrated. Um, um, it just carried on like that um, for a long time. Yep. And suddenly I took a picture of a vehicle. I didn't know what it was. I saw what people were calling it, looked for pictures of that vehicle online and could clearly see it wasn't that vehicle. And it was that hook that then got me interested in trying to find out what these vehicles were. So um, sought experts on these vehicles and suddenly realized that almost everything we knew about the wreck was wrong. And that was kind of the catalyst for me about 10 years ago to start trying to photograph absolutely everything on the wreck. And then with really good detailed photos, going to experts who kind of rebuild these vehicles as a hobby, um, who could actually then, you know, from a rusted, marine life encrusted, damaged vehicle in a wreck, could actually tell what it was. And that opened this incredible sort of Pandora's box of information where it completely changed our opinion on what was on the wreck. So that was kind of what got me involved in this project. And then the book is really the upshot of all our research both, you know, from military archives all the way through to, you know, to 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 the historical historic military vehicles. And we've really set out to not only photogrammetrically cover the whole wreck and create models of it, but we can really tell you where all the different vehicles are. So for anyone who's diving this wreck, they get a much more enhanced experience. Because if you ask the average diver, oh, you know, you've dived this school, how many trucks do you think are on there? People say, I don't know, 10, 15. And they're shocked when you tell them, no, it's 70. How many mm. motorbikes? Oh, maybe 20. There's more than 100 motorbikes. Mm. And I think people don't realize, and they're not all the same. They're very, there's lots of different ones. Mm. And many of the vehicles on the Fiscal are very rare in terms of what's left over still of those old vehicles now. There's, um, maybe I should show you some photos, in, in, really. But, um, you know, there are vehicles on there that there is one or even no remaining examples of in the rest of the world. And I yep. think that's, you know, it's fascinating. It really in, in, enhances your enjoyment of the wreck. Yeah. I think one of the things about this gun that we probably need to be a little bit aware of as well, um, and certainly imaging has helped with this, is, is it's not been been looked after terribly well by visiting divers, no. particularly in the past. Um, yeah. And there is significant amounts of diver damage to these vehicles and other parts of the wreck as well. Um, the wreck itself, of course, is, is degrading with time, but, um, mm. the, you know, there's still a people yeah, out there. Yeah, these, I mean, in the book, sorry, my, the, the green screen is not really helping with showing the pictures, but um, th these are some before and after pictures of, of, of some quite serious damage. The main issue that this had is that in the first few years of it opening up to popular diving, there was a trend that almost that was sort of percolated through the diving world that everyone wanted to bring a souvenir back from it. Mm, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, it was... You know, it, and it was not no one really stopped to think it was just what everyone did. So in those first few years, you know, people would go down with hammers yeah. and anything that could be pulled off the wreck was pulled off the wreck. And that's actually why the military vehicles were misidentified for so long, because yeah. all the badges were pulled off the wreck, stuck in people's suitcases and rusted away in people's sheds, garden yeah. sheds and things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and as a result, no, just when people got interested in knowing what was on there all the identifying features had all been ripped off. Yeah, yeah. Then things kind of sort of stabilized since then. And yes, there has been a slow, you know, people do occasionally steal things, but yeah. generally it's been a relatively slow thing since the early 90s. Yeah. The main problem has been is the way that boats have tied onto the wreck to yeah. dive. It. And for a long time, there was some quite careless tying on where people would tie onto bits of the wreck. You know, the wind would change the boat, the, the dive boats would move and they'd basically rip chunks and bits off the top of the wreck. But again, that's also been clamped down on and is much improved from how it has been in the past. Yeah. I think I think the other thing about the Thyscom is is that it is a, a, a phenomenally beautiful wreck in many ways because it is um, obviously has recognisable human influences, but it also has a great deal of life on it. So um, mm. and it, you know it's all encrusted and very beautiful. Um, and and I know Alex, you've got some pictures, haven't you? So so should we should we have a look at some of those? Um, yeah, yeah. The book has got more than 150 of my underwater photos in, not including the ones that are in the photogrammetry models. 
Um, we also, one last thing about the book, we also, Mike, um, rebuilt from the ship's plans a complete 3D model of the wreck of the ship as it was in life, um, wow. which is also really interesting. So we've got both that and the photogrammetry model, both to scale, which can be blended and overlaid throughout the book. So we use that to help people really appreciate, you know, what they're seeing. Um, and then that's topped up by, by, as I said, 150 of my photos. And I've just pulled out, I think, eight today to have a quick look at and just talk through them. Yeah. So um, this is the first one. Yep. And it's a... Um, it's a it's an off-camera strobe photo for the photographers out there um, of a of of the cabs of these um, Bedford OYC um, um, water bowser trucks. Um, this is actually one of the more common vehicles that still exists on land. It's a very common Second World War general service truck. It's kind yep. of a small lorry, um, yep. and um, it's quite a distinctive vehicle and quite easy to recognise. Once you, you know your, your, your vehicles, it's kind of got a, a very rounded cab and a very square bonnet um, or hood, as you say in the States. So. And this is a photo from the, the um, I'm inside the cab of one of these trucks shooting through into the cab of the second truck and the strobes in the second truck. Now, I took this picture back in 2013 and in 2017, this steering wheel that's in this picture got stolen. So yeah. this photo, as it is, is no longer possible. And that is a, an interesting, you know, good reminder that, you know, sadly, people are still taking things. You know, it's, I, you know, it's very sad that people want to take things like this um, mm -hmm. from the wreck. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the next picture is um, another off-camera strobe shot of a pair of quite bulky-looking lorries. And these are actually the cabs of, um, a, of, of an, um, an aircraft refueling truck there's actually six of these on the Thistlecorn. None of these exist in life anymore. There's none, Gosh. apart from the six on the Thistlecorn, there are none of these um, fighter plane refueling trucks. Um, they're quite common if you look at old archive war footage, because yep. every time, you know, they kind of tended to film Spitfires and things on the runway, and these guys are always around, so they're quite common to see in footage. But none exist anymore of these Albion AM463 um, um, refueling trucks. And yeah, they've got, you can see a little bit of spring, that sort of springy metal twisted around just above the wheel arch there. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, um, that spring, that's part of the old fuel hose. And so the back of these had a fuel tank. It's got a pump mechanism and had three hoses coming off to be able to fill different, different trucks. And that's, that's the reinforcing in the, in the hose, isn't it? Yeah. 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 That's the reinforcing. Yeah. So the, the kind of the hose material is, is rotted away. Yeah. And so behind you can actually see the rear end of one. That's yep. kind of been pushed up in the air by the, uh, the sinking. And that's the tank area. And then you can see the cab of one here. Yep. They actually only have um, one door that opens. Um, right. So they just have a driver's door and then the spare wheel is attached on the passenger side. And the, um, there's actually the, the passenger actually rode on the outside because the passenger was there to attach the fuel hoses. So they never went inside. So it has one seat. The passenger rode outside. I like these. I, I can talk about all these vehicles forever. But the, the temperature gauge for the radiator on this, rather than being in the cab of the vehicle, actually sticks out the top of the radiator. So it's like a diving regulator gauge sticking out the top of your radiator, telling you how, how hot your car is. Useful and they've got, in North Africa, yep, yep. Yeah, they've got really cool little features. And I, I, I must move on, otherwise I, I can talk about all these vehicles forever. Um, <laughs> and I've actually, um, so although that none of these refueling trucks exist, there is, there are four of this model of truck left in the world, and they're all owned by one man. Oh. Um, I've actually been to his house and photographed them and sat in them, and they're really tall. They're about ten feet tall when you stand next to them. Wow. They, they, when you float over them on the wreck, they feel smaller. Um, usually things look bigger underwater, but the vehicles look bigger on land. It's quite strange. Anyway, um, the next picture is just a picture of the stern of the wreck. Yeah. Um, there's lots of pictures of the outside of the wreck. Um, it's a, it is a beautiful wreck. It's an amazing dive when the conditions are right. Yep. Um, but you know, photographically we tend to be drawn there by the vehicles cause that's what makes this wreck unique. Yeah. I mean, certainly the, the rear gun is quite a, it's quite a photographic, mm -hmm. um, iconic photographic subject as well though, isn't it? So yeah. Um, and, and, and these, um, cargo ships were only allowed to have rear facing guns. It yep. was kind of part of the rule of warfare. If you had a forward facing gun, you were an aggressor. And yep. therefore, you were fair game to attack. A rearward facing gun means that you're ju it's just a defensive gun and you're a merchant ship. You're not a military ship. 
Yeah, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, useful for um, running away with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, when the Thistlegorn was attacked, she wasn't allowed. I'm going to. You're going to get me distracted on every point here. She wasn't allowed to defend herself. She was part of a convoy. And because the ships were all parked, um, moored quite close together in this anchorage area, um, they were they were instructed on the radio they couldn't fire at the bomber because um, they might hit one of the other boats with friendly fire. And yeah. the battleship that was guarding them was supposed to be taking care of all the defense, but they, they didn't get going in time and didn't get didn't weren't. And so. She was very much a sitting, sitting duck when she was sunk. All right, the next picture are some motorbikes covered in soldier fish. These are uh, Norton M16 military motorbikes from the Second World War. Took a long time to actually accurately identify these motorbikes and learn how to tell them apart underwater. But as it happens, all the ones on the lower deck are all Nortons, and all the ones on the upper deck of the holds are all BSA motorbikes. So if you're diving the wreck, they're easy to tell apart by, by where they are. Um, I like the ones on the lower deck photographically because there's a lot of fish in that area. Well, how do you like that? What's that light in the background, Alex? Um, the light in the background is actually um, a diver with a torch who just happened say, yeah. to be there. And I just um, I don't think that they were posing for me on purpose. I just when you're shooting in these dark holes, anything you can use to create depth in the images you yeah. want to use. So you're often running very long exposures to get any ambient light through into the background or you're using remote lighting or just making use of passing divers with torches and things just yeah. to create a bit of light in the background. Yeah. yeah. Right, the, um, the next image is, um, is often called the, the secret room or the hidden room of the wreck. Um, and it's actually part of hold number five, so right at the stern section. And this is a room that's full of, of four inch ammunition shells. Each of these boxes has um, four, um, eight, 12 shells in, 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 the, in the box stacked up. And these are ammo boxes. And a lot of people don't realize this room is there, and it's quite a cool room. So part of telling the story of the book is to show people that even know the wreck very well, views on the wreck they maybe have never seen and never mm. understood. This ammo, there's actually one on the other side as well, because the, the ship is, is, was loaded very symmetrically. So yeah. on the upper side, but you can't really, you can only just get your head in it to see it. But it's the same on the other side as well. This one you can swim into. Yeah. Um, right, the, um, the, the next image is a view down on top of a truck um, with some fish over it. Um, and this is on the lower level of, of hold two. And this is a truck made by the Ford Motor Company. Their agricultural division in that air, that, that time was called Fordsons. And this yeah. is a Fordson um, Watt three truck. So what is war, war, war office truck or war office transport? Um, so just, just a British name for a vehicle. And this is a Watt three A um there and again these were big these are really quite big trip pickups kind of very large pickup trucks so bigger than your pickup truck adam um that's big kind of <laughs> yeah no big yeah kind of, and cross of the lorry um but but very slow <laughs> i'm not, not yeah, going but, yeah, like um, yeah but um yeah but um and the back of most of these is loaded with those norton motorbikes this particular one isn't but but the other most of the others are and I've got an off-camera strobe inside the cab here. The off-camera strobes just help create a bit of depth in these images to allow you to to open up the space inside the wreck and to create eye-catching images. Uh, and obviously the blue in the background, you've done that by really sort of shutter speed, I assume. Yeah, and, and also timing the dive to the right time. Um, yeah. During the middle of the day, it's easier to get brighter backgrounds for these types of shots. It's on the um, road, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. the sun really penetrates. It's really because of the shape of the wreck. The light doesn't get down into the into the lower parts of the wreck. Yeah. Okay, um, just the final two. Um, this is one of the, the classic um, motorbikes on the wreck. There's The upper deck is full of um, a huge number, I think about 70 of these BSA motorbikes. I can't remember the number right off, off, off hand. Well, there's, I think there's 14 trucks with five in the back of each. Yeah. Um, but one of the trucks only got four in because Cousteau lifted one of the, the the motorbikes up onto deck and there's photos of him doing that back in the 50s and you can see which one is missing and we've marked it on the map so people can see the the um the nice Those thing bikes. about symmetric loading is you know when you see a break in the pattern you can tell when things have happened um and this this one is one that on my workshops we've nicknamed ellie's bike because long ago i took a picture of my wife posing by this and it's a well-known picture and um so we just named this bike after her because it's it's probably the most photogenic motorbike on the wreck. It's also nice and shallow, easy to find, and it's well positioned for, for photography. 
So yeah. whenever I run workshops there, it's always one that I make sure everyone gets in front of simply because it's, it's very photogenic and easy, easy to find. Yeah. Um, not all the motorbikes are so well positioned for pictures. Yeah. And then the final picture is something a little bit different. Um, this, um, the, the, the physical had two locomotives on, on, on it and they both blew off the wreck when the wreck um, exploded, when it was bombed and landed upright on the seabed on either side of the wreck. And although they look very much like locomotives, actually, they're just often the very front of the locomotives. And mm. on the port side of the wreck, this is actually the other part of the locomotive. This is the, the, the boiler part of the locomotive and mm. the, the fire, the firebox. Um, so, you know, where where the steam was generated to power it. And this is a little bit further out of the wreck and not many people have been out to see this. So that was right. also something we wanted to bring into the wreck was to show people things that, again, even if they dive the wreck a lot, they haven't, haven't seen before. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully that gives you a sort of a nice introduction into to my passion project from the last decade. Um, it has been a total obsession, I have to admit. I, I have a long and long, I've been diving to Sagorm, probably not quite as long as you, Alex, but certainly for a long time. Um, and it's a fascinating place and a fascinating dive and the history is fascinating. But uh, I also, I mean, every time things like the schools, Barracuda on the bow and, you know, all mm. the other stuff that goes on there, it's, it's just a, it's a very special place, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and I think the fact it's not always easy because um, it is exposed to strong tides. Mm. And when the tides run from the north, they bring murky water over the wreck. Mm. So, you know, it's often only one in four dives there. You have really nice photographic conditions and it's deep. So you rarely have anything like the amount of time you'd like. Mm. And all those factors make the pictures feel that much more precious because it's mm. not a place that you can go to and in one dive mop up everything. It takes yeah, yeah. a lot of dives to see it all. It takes a lot of dives, even more dives to photograph it all. Yeah, sure, sure. Fantastic, Alex. Thank you for that. Where can people get the book from? So at the moment, it's only available in the UK. Um, it's just come out. Um, it's hardback only at the moment. Um, hopefully, I mean, so you can order it from Amazon in the UK. You can order it from the publishers, divedup.com. And both of those will have options for shipping it further afield. But we do hope to have it distributed more widely um, around the place in time. I know we're really hopeful to get when the softback edition comes out, sometime in the future we definitely one of the reasons for doing a softback edition was to make it easier to ship the book to egypt as well so it can be available locally when people are actually diving the wreck because the nice thing of this book is is actually to take it with you and yep. to read it when you're diving the wreck because it really you know when you the a few years ago i you know finally created a map before we did the photogrammetry of the layout of the holds and the first dive I did after creating that map where I really knew what I was seeing was so amazing. It was like a hundred times better than any dive I'd ever done before on the wreck. Cause it was just like, Oh my God, there's so much more than I realized. Yeah. And I think that's what the book can give anyone who goes diving there. It, it opens your eyes to seeing how much is there. And it, yeah, it's, it's absolutely, so I really hope people take it out there. So it's, it's probably worth just mentioning as well, briefly um, to get to the wreck. Um, there are, primarily two options the first of all is a liverboard from um probably from hagada or via sham and um, when sham mm -hmm. opens up um, they also they do run day boat rides again when sham opens up you can get down on a day boat um, although that is arguably more challenging so um, essentially it's access via primarily via two red sea ports uh, egyptian mm -hmm. sea ports um, and obviously once travel opens up um, put it on everyone's list really um yeah and so, and any any typical Northern Egypt Red Sea itinerary will do several dives in the Fiskorn because it's it's the most requested, most popular dive there. And, and certainly on the photographic workshops, you know, the, they're certainly one of the places that if the conditions are good, quite often people will hang around there for a while getting pictures. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've run Fiskorn special trips where we've done, you know, more than more than half the week just on the wreck. And yeah. people don't they, you know, they complain about leaving after that. They just, you know, it is a direct. The more you dive it, the more you want to dive it, the more you shoot it the more you want to shoot it more. It's, it, yeah. it's very addictive. Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. Um, and um, I'd like to thank our sponsor, which is Reef Photo and Video. Um, please feel free to add any comments. I'll add a link to um, Dived Up in the comment section as well, so, um, so you'll be able to access uh, ordering the book through there. Please drop us a like if you enjoyed this, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.